Hey, welcome to another episode of Code Hour. This is episode 23, and I'm going to go over what multi tenancy is and how it works, and how it works specifically in ASP.NET Boilerplate. And if you don't know what that is, definitely check out episode number 19, which I did a couple months ago, and it's been my most popular video by far. So this is kind of digging into that a little bit more detail. And so before we can go too much further, we have to talk about what multi-tenancy is. So imagine you've got this scenario. You've got an app you've built, maybe a software as a service. We could say maybe it sells products or widgets or something to, to people. And you have it available for one department, but then another department comes over and says, hey, we love all, all that, all those features and that wonderful piece of software we have. We, we want that same piece of software except we don't want to be able to see the other person's data and we don't want them to see our data. Um, you could imagine something similar if you have if you're building like a banking product or something and you and you sell it to one bank and then you white label it off to another bank. It's an increasingly common practice especially in um, today's world of, of putting things into the cloud. So how do you accomplish that? Well um, if you go and check out uh, ASP.NET Boilerplate's multi-tenancy page here they actually do a great job. It's, it's worth reading this document. They they go over the different types of multi-tenancy solutions and the the uh, we'll say the least technical one is to have multiple deployments with multiple databases. In this scenario, basically, you take your app, your database, and you plunk it off to one um, Azure instance or uh, AKS instance. Um, and then you then you do another one, and, and then you do a third one, and then you do a fourth one. The problem with this is you've often got the problem where you can have different versions running in, in different places. So managing it, maintaining it is kind of a pain, and the price can be really high because you've got one set of instances of everything in your cloud environment. So it's uh, it, it's it's a solution. It's a fine solution. But what ASP.NET, and you don't even need, I mean, it's not really multi-tenancy, but what ASP.NET Boilerplate brings to the table is three additional ways of doing deployments if you choose to. So the simplest one, the one that I like the most, single deployment, single database. In this scenario, and this is what you get out of the box when you install ASP.NET Boilerplate, is you have one app and anytime you create a database table you can just say hey this is multi a multi-tenant enabled product for example and then it it adds a, a foreign key off to the tenants table all behind the scenes and it just makes it all work so that tenant number one cannot see tenant number two's data and tenant number two cannot see tenant number one's data. And the wonderful thing about this is because you've got one database and one environment, you don't have any problems, any complexities of deploying to multiple different places and keeping track of different versions. Um, it's, it's much simpler and the price is going to be much lower um, in, in terms of resources. So that's, that's really nice. But ASP.NET Polarblade takes it even further than that, which is which is cool, when you go and create a new tenant, and I'll, I'll show this in just a second, when you go create a new tenant, you can choose to have a database connection string that you specify, and so you can have all of each individual tenant um, have their own database. And so this would be single deployment, multiple databases. So it's kind of a, a, a good middle ground in terms of being able to only have to worry about the, the your application is only deployed once, there's one deployment of your application but then there can be a whole bunch of different databases and you have nice much, much better separation between the different databases um, customer one could never see customer two's data it's, well it'd be much much harder because it's a completely separate database instance price is going to be a little bit higher um, and and then it ASP.NET Boilerplate gets even cooler than that because they allow a hybrid scenario where you could have a lot of your customers sharing a database, but if you've got one really heavy usage customer coming in, like, you know, you're selling to all these little vendors, and then all of a sudden Microsoft comes along and like, we want that, and you're like, oh crap, we've got to scale up massively to make Microsoft work. Well, in that case, it would be more like sharding. You can just have a separate database just for your really heavy user databases 
and maybe that costs more for you, but you can pass on those costs back to your customer. And in this case, Microsoft, you could charge them a lot more because your costs are a lot higher. And so this hybrid scenario where you have different tenants, sometimes tenants share, get, get put on the shared instance, but sometimes they're broken out into individual instances is wonderful. And all of this, I'm describing at a high level, is what ASP.NET Boilerplate gives you out of the box. And it is a amazing set of features and it is from my perspective just the reason why you absolutely should use ASP.NET Boilerplate if you are doing multi-tenancy on your next project or you even might be doing multi-tenancy on your next project. Okay so there's my overview. Uh, let's get let's dig into the details. I haven't done any coding yet uh, so let's let's do that. First of all uh, the question is what if you want to disable multi-tenancy? Well when you start it up by default it actually turns on multi-tenancy by default and so at the episode end of episode 19 uh, we ended up with this. We had a lease store application that we had generated and we created a products table and I, I kind of glossed over it real quickly, but at the top of the login screen, it gives you the choice of who you want to log in as. And if you click this text box, you can you can switch to logging in as the host or logging in as the single default tenant. You get one te default tenant out of the box always, and then you get a host. In a multi uh, in it in a multi tenancy environment, the host account is kind of important because it's the it's like a singleton. There's only ever going to be one of them. Even if you have a whole bunch of tenants, there'll only be one host. And that host is the account that can create new tenants. You can think about it as sort of like an Uber admin. It's the, it's the people who can see everything potentially although they don't they don't have to be it's a great account to put in like logging information so you can see logs or you can see analytics and whatnot but it's not going to generally contain your products and your widgets and whatever your it is your application does so just to show that I'm going to log in now I just put in blank in that box and then when I log in uh, here I am logged in as a host you can see that there is a tab here called tenants and there's only one of them right now and that is the default tenant. If I create a new tenant and we could call this oh I don't know Microsoft uh, you'll see that there's a field here for the database connection string and that was what I was talking about earlier if you want to be able to have a particular tenant dedicated to a particular database otherwise you leave this null and, and empty and it will do a share it'll do everything in a shared single database instance and what one of the beauties of the architecture of ASP and a boilerplate here is that the code is like identical in well, it's yeah it's completely identical in in both cases you can't tell from a code perspective and so you could even potentially just move take an existing customer that was in the shared instance and move it off to its own database and the code would be identical and the way they do it is through interfaces and I'll get into that in just a second say go we've got an admin email address notice that it shows the default password 123qwe so we've got a Microsoft tenant and if I log out now I can log in um, so, but check this out in the end of episode 18 we created a products table and here it is the products table but this is a little weird we really should not see the products table in the host account this is the type of thing that really only belongs to tenants and what's even a little bit stranger is if I now log in, I'm logged in as the host, I can see this siren of shame. And if I log in as any other new tenant, I'll see the same data. By the way, so I've just typed in the word Microsoft to change the tenant, but a piece, a whole piece of this is how the application determines which tenant, how ASP.NET Boilerplate determines which tenant you're logged in as. And if you view their blog post here, or their documentation here, on multi-tenancy, there's a whole section about how they determine the current tenant. It's worth reading this, but the short version is, you are not stuck with this weird dialog box. It will look into the domain name, and if you are a Microsoft.myproduct, 
dot com slash whatever it'll look at the subdomain and it'll pull the tenant name out of there by default and you can skip this whole dialog box also there's a variety of other ways you can set it via cookie which is actually what this is doing behind the scenes or you can also set it in the host um, there's a if you put it in the HTTP headers there's a HTTP header that you can specify and and so that's an option as well but for a quick demo this works really nicely okay and here I am logged back in as Microsoft and when I go to the products table look at that check that out that siren of shame product is still there under products and that's because at the end of the last episode 19 I did not make products tenant aware to make a table tenant aware you need to implement an interface and there are two interfaces that you can potentially implement so here I am in product and if I implement I um, I must have tenant there, there 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 you can see I may have tenant and I must have tenant so the most common one the one you're probably going to do every time is I must have tenant and that says that I must have a tenant ID a non nullable tenant ID um, however if it's I may have tenant then it will be a a nullable tenant ID and the tenant ID in this case if it's null that means it belongs to the host so I may have tenant says this product either belongs to one of the tenants or it belongs to the host if the tenant ID is null I think, uh, I think we're going to keep this uh, a little simpler and we'll just do the most common case. So I must have tenant. And if I go and take a look in the database right now, you'll see that products has an ID, a name, and a quantity. It does not have a tenant ID. So we need to create an entity framework database migration. So this is going to be just like we did at the end of, uh, in episode 19. I'm going to go to the package manager console and add a migration. I cannot forget to go up to the drop down here and select that my default project has to be uh, yeah, Entity Framework Core. It has to be Entity Framework Core. Yes, it wants to add a column and it's going to add to the products table a tenant ID. It's going to be non-nullable. That's exactly what, exactly what we expect. Okay, let's run this guy. And this brings us to a point about multi-tenancy that's really important. Normally, and in the previous demo, I said the way to do this, or at least in development, the way to do this is to update database, I believe. And that's fine. But update database only works on one database, and in, and in particular, it only works on the database that it picks up from the app settings.json file. However, I told you that there's this multi multi database scenario. What happens if you have five different databases, and you need to run a migration on all of your five different databases? Well, what's awesome is that ASP.NET Boilerplate totally takes that into account. That is one of the nice side effects of having a dedicated project in here called a migrator. And the migrator project, I told you it was a way to easily run your migrations in your continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, scenario, but it's actually much cooler than that. It is also a way to run your uh, uh, entity framework upgrades across multiple databases and it will take a look into the master database which is specified in the app settings.json file and it'll look in the connection set connection strings of each of the tenants and it'll upgrade all of those too super cool love that feature it's it's really really powerful um, i'm a little bit lazy uh, i only have one database and i uh, want to do this quickly so i'm just going to run update database okay here we are it applied my migration Put in the date, add 1082 products, and if I go back to the database products here and I refresh this, we should now see a tenant ID. Excellent, and it is not null, so 
that existing product that we had, Siren of Shame, it probably got set to the default value, which was zero. There are no tenants that I'm aware of called zero. They all start at one. So if I go look in ABP tenants and I select the top 1,000, we should see the default one. Yep, there's default with an ID of one. And there's Microsoft with an ID of two. So if I'm, I'm here, logged in here as Microsoft, and if I, if I refresh this, Oh, it disappeared. It actually did. Um, it disappeared because one of the other wonderful features of ASP.NET Boilerplate is it, is it introduces these um, filters, and the filters get a run every single time you run a query. And I mentioned the uh, iDeletable interface and how there's a filter in Entity Framework in ASP.NET Boilerplate for that. So if you have iDeletable, I think that's what it's called, and you call delete on it, it gets soft deleted, and whenever you query for that soft deleted product, then it will never show up. It'll act as if it doesn't really exist in the database, but it's actually been soft deleted. That feature's really cool. Well, there's a second filter as well that says, okay, who am I currently logged in as? In this case, it's admin, and who is the tenant of the user that I'm currently logged in as, which in this case is Microsoft, now only show me, in this case, products, if I'm implementing I must have tenant, whose tenant ID is equal to my currently logged in user's tenant, which is really, really cool. And you can see this in effect by if I were to go into my products table right now and edit this, and we saw that tenant ID 2 was equal to Microsoft. So if I set this to 2 and refresh this, then it shows up. That's really cool. If I add a new product, then, oh, an internal error occurred. OK, hang on. Well, let's, uh, let's debug this real quick. Oh, uh, OK. I think I mentioned this before, but I use Beartail all the time. Anytime you see an error message, ASP.NET Boilerplate does the right thing. It pops up a message to, to you as an end user that doesn't give you any details. You have to look in the logs. You have to look in logs.txt in the app data directory. And now I can see that there's a missing type map configuration of unsupported mapping. And I guess I forgot to say that when I create a new product, and, and actually, this might have been uh, when I upgraded ASP.NET Boilerplate to the latest version. But when I create a new product DTO, it's trying to map it into a product. And it's saying, there's no mapping that exists. And that is probably because a product DTO auto maps from a product. So when we're reading, it'll take a product and auto convert it into a product DTO. But we need another one of these, which will auto map to product. I think that should fix that should fix this error. Build succeeded. Let's try running this again. Okay, and we would like to add a new product. We've got a mug. I saw a mug called uh, it says break the build, feel the shame on it, which is super fun. Okay, there we go. It added. And and what's really cool about this is if we go and look in the database, I about guarantee you that the tenant ID was automatically set to two. Let's check this out. We're going to refresh this, and yeah, there it is. The Siren Shame mug has a tenant ID of two. So when we when we query things that have I must have tenant, it automatically reads in and requires, tacks in that tenant ID equals equals two on, into the query. And when we write it back out, it will always insert the tenant ID as the currently logged in user's tenant, which is awesome. Love this feature. And what's beautiful about this facility is that it doesn't matter whether you have a single database configuration or you have a multiple database configuration. It works, the code works exactly the same either way. So I, I love that feature. I think that's really cool. Um, I think we're not quite done yet. Oh, I didn't talk about how to turn it off. Let's, let me talk about that really quick. So multi-tenancy is enabled by default, but 
if you don't care about multi-tenancy, and I know it's a little bit too far into this video to probably talk about this topic, but if you if you don't need multi-tenancy, the first thing you need to do is turn it off. And you can do that in, I think uh, there's a module, a uh, core module, and there's like multi-tenancy that is enabled. It's setting that off on the core module. These modules, if you're not familiar with it, is a pattern that ASP.NET Boilerplate implements where each project is a module and modules have startup and shutdown capabilities. So when the app starts, it starts the, uh, there's like a module associated with the, the host site down here. And that in its um, definition of the module says, hey, I'm dependent on these other things. One of the things it's dependent on is the core module. And then the core module starts up, and then it says, I'm dependent on these other things. And there's modules which are available inside of ASP.NET Boilerplate you can pull down and whatnot. But um, we don't need to get too much into those details. But when this module is starting, then we configure some things. And one of the things that we want to configure is whether multi-tenancy is enabled. And it goes over to this, the name of your project consts. So, you know, if your project is uh, sell a bunch of stuff, then it would be uh, sell a bunch of stuff consts. And, and then you can go into the multi-tenancy enabled. And if you set that to false and recompile, Okay, uh, I set that I set the that to false. I logged into the home page, and you'll notice there's no longer an option of choosing which tenant you want to log in as. Whether you want to log in as the host or the tenant or tenant number two or tenant number three or whatever, that disappears, and now there is only the default tenant. So if you are like, wait, I didn't. I said I didn't want tenancy. Yeah, you're kind of still stuck with the default tenant. But what's nice is if you ever need tenant multi-tenancy in the future, you can just turn it back on again, and everything is just going to be really easy to move into multi-tenancy. So this is a wonderful, like, this is such a great framework. I love ASP.NET Boilerplate, and um, with respect to if you ever might use multi-tenancy, then it's absolutely something you should use. Um, okay, I'm going to go back and turn multi-tenancy back on. Okay, so I've turned back on multi-tenancy and now I'm going to log back in as the host site. And what do you think you're going to see if you go in and take a look at products right now? Okay, yeah, the answer is you're going to see all of the products across all of the tenants. And so even if we have tenant one, tenant two and we refresh the list of products here it's going to show all of the products and the reason for this is because we haven't set up the permissions correctly yet in fact we probably don't want to see products at all when we go into the host site and so I don't know if you remember back to episode 19 but in there when I set up the products app service here, I created a new permission called pages products. It was just something I threw off that says you have the ability to read, write, update, and uh, create, read, update, and delete uh, products. Now, if I needed to make them more granular than I could, but um, these, this particular permission that I created, I created it in the here we go in the authorization provider and in this authorization provider there was an override that I'd never specified it's an optional parameter called oh yeah there it is uh, multi-tenancy sides I kinda wish this permission was required by default to force you to think about it because the default value for this permission says I want anyone that's either a host or a tenant to be able to have permissions to do this thing. But you really should give it, especially in a multi-tenancy site, you should always give it a, some consideration because some actions are specific to hosts, some actions are specific to tenants, the vast majority of them are specific to tenants, and then only rarely are they applicable to both. The ability to manage users and roles is, is actually kind of the an oddball out. It's the it's one of the few things that can be done by both the host and the tenant. So 
products really should have said multi-tenancy sides. Uh, this permission, I would like it to be uh, tenant only. There we go. So if I save and compile this, and that's all I have to do because this happens on app startup. These permissions get registered on app startup. And I go back into my, actually I gotta refresh the whole page. Then products should uh, disappear from the left hand side. Okay, products did not disappear from the left hand side. Uh, interestingly enough though, I cannot navigate to them. So something funny is happening in the left nav. I... Oh, here we go, so, yeah, sidebar. Uh, in the sidebar nav component products, Okay, I might have glossed over this real quick here, but the second parameter when you're specifying these links on the left-hand side is the permission that should enable someone to view that left nav. And in this case, this should have been pages.products. It was the name that we used in the permission names on the back end. It's sort of like a magic string, which is a little bit objectionable, but uh, it, it is what it is, and so yeah, that should have been pages.products, and in the app route guard, it used the same magic string, Okay, and which is why it was working. I didn't make the typo there, but I did make the typo here. So if I'm saving, I'm recompiling, this, app is, this page is going to reload itself in Angular. Okay, there we go, perfect. The, use, the products completely disappeared, as we would expect it to, and if I log back in to one of the tenants, then I should see the, I should see that again. Oh, excellent. We have logged back in as, um, as Microsoft, as the admin account in Microsoft, and here we can see the CyberShame mug. So let's get into some a little bit more interesting scenarios. Imagine under certain circumstances, you really want to be able to view all of the products regardless of the tenant or let's say if some conditions are met or you're logged into a specific tenant then I want to be able to view all the products. This is a little bit of a stretch this scenario but I'm going to code it up so I can show you a couple of different cool features that you can do if that you're almost certainly need to do at some point. So if I go into the products app service right now there is a um, yeah, okay, well, first of all, let's, let's say when I'm retrieving all of the products, if I'm logged into tenant two, Microsoft, Microsoft's a super user, can see all the products for some reason, I don't know, whatever, um, then I'm gonna show you all the products from all the tenants. So first of all, mm, we need to, I think we either override, oh, let's do it down, not in the constructor. I'm just going to decompile get all. I do this all the time, and you should have a decompiler built into your IDE as well because it makes life an awful lot easier with ASP.NET Boilerplate. So what is it doing? First, it's checking permissions, and then it's creating a query. Hmm, creating that query seems pretty interesting. I think that's probably what we need to override. Yeah, let's override create filtered query. And in this case, we want to say if tenant ID is equal equal to two, right? Then we're going to do something else. Uh, not quite sure what. Well, to do that, to get the currently logged in tenant ID, we can ask for a new thing here in the constructor using constructor injection. Oh, yeah, it's IABP session. Okay, oh yeah, it's IABP session. IABP session. So we can get session. And this is the place where you can get the currently logged in user. And you can also get the currently logged in tenant ID. So in this case, it would be session dot. And you'll see there's like a user, a tenant ID. Um, you can do some impersonation and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that's so when tenant ID is equal, equal to two. Then, now in this case, we want to turn off the filter. And so to turn off the filter, 
we need to, uh, I forget exactly what it is, let's go over to the, the documentation. Okay, documentation, there's a whole section on data filters here, and I must have tenant, and, aha, here it is, here's how to disable a filter, we want to disable using the unit of work manager and because we're in an app service we have convenient access to the current unit of work it's just the current unit of work if we were not implementing extending an async CRUD app service or a app service then if we were only doing an i async CRUD app service then we could get the i current unit of work manager and we could go to i current unit of work manager dot current uh, to get it, but we got this little shortcut here because we've got the concrete class uh, that we're inheriting from. So current unit of work dot filters dot, uh, what was this again? Disable filter. Oh, maybe it's just dot disable filter. There we go. And the filter name will be like I uh, ABP data filters. And I think there's only two of them. Which one? must have tenant may have tenant and soft delete okay the must have tenant is what we want to disable and then I think if we just do that I think that should work and so what we've shown is two things how to get the current tenant ID and how to turn off the filter so that you can view all data all right let's try this and actually I've not even I did a I did a run through of this and um, I just didn't do this and so I'm just making it up. Don't know if it's going to work. Oh, we need to do a using statement. Ah, rats! That didn't work. All right, I'm going to debug it. Okay, well, that'll teach me to go off script. I'm pretty sure that this is not working because uh, the this is returning an iQueryable, and the iQueryable is not actually being executed until um, later. So what I was gonna try instead is just taking this uh, later in the in the get all method. So actually, maybe I'm gonna try taking all this out here and just doing it at the parent level. Okay, well, that didn't work. Um, maybe it's because we have passed control to a different, um, uh, from, from our assembly into a secondary assembly. So I'm gonna try just writing up all the code that happens in GetAll. This, this is gonna work. It's gotta work because I've been working at this for like five or 10 minutes and uh, all off, off camera, of course, and it's uh, been failing in a bunch of different ways, but I've been learning something interesting and maybe you have to. Oh, hey there, it finally worked, yay. So I, I yeah, interesting thing is if you go into a different assembly, this uh, disable filter thing apparently doesn't work. It only works uh, within your current assembly. And if you're ever curious about what get all does, this is the equivalent of the get all code. And it, um, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's basically applying sorting, applying padging, turning each of your entities into an entity DTO, and they're turning a paged result, which requires a total count. You need to figure out how many total items because it's doing pagination. So, okay, so great, there we are. And probably if I log in as the default tenant right now that I'm only going to see the products that apply to that. All right, there it is. They only see the one product that applies to them. Okay, um, there's only like one miscellaneous thing that I didn't show that I've never actually needed to do, but you might need at some point, and that is to simulate some other some other tenant if you do that you go to the current unit of work manager and you can set tenant id actually i have need to do this um, this is something that's really handy to do when you are in the context of creating a new tenant and let's say you're you need to create a tenant 
if you're logged in as the host, because you always are logged in as the host when you create a new tenant, but let's say you've created that tenant and now you want to pretend to be the tenant that you just created, then you can current unit of work dot set tenant ID five or whatever, and then everything within that using block there is now done in the context of the use the tenant that you just created even though you're logged in as the host. That's a great example of when to use that. So, okay, there we are. We have gone over, I've gone over um, the basics of multi-tenancy in ASP.NET Boilerplate. I hope that you have learned something. I hope that this was fun. If so, please like, please subscribe, um, you know, all that stuff. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you around. Um, hopefully in the next uh, month, I'll get another video. And, and uh, please let me know if this was useful. Feel free to chime in on the comments. This video was actually produced as a result of someone that chimed in on the comments of one of my other videos. So thank you very much and uh, cheers. I'm going to try and figure out how to turn this thing off now.